CAO Jimmy, thanks Hi. for coming out here. Hi, Dave. Thanks for having me. Give us an overview of what your impression is of the relationship between the Jones Act, and I know it's commercial, and uh, America's national defense. You know, there's a big disconnect there. You know, people uh, have a hard time correlating between our national defense and recreational boating and cruising. Uh, when they hear national defense, they automatically think of the Navy. But the Jones Act is private fleets, okay? Cabotage, in other words, it, it, the, the beauty of the Jones Act is that it allows us to protect our national shores. And we control what comes in, what comes out. We have records because, mind you, the Jones Act is built, you know, our ships are built in America. They're flagged in America. They're operated. Uh, we control what comes in, what comes out, and we're competitive in doing it. So um, to get the average American to understand the correlation between Jones Act shipping and recreational and military, it's, it's tough. Yeah, and I was going to ask, if the Jones Act is that important, why has it been so hard to get the nation to focus on the national security implications of the Jones Act, and, and what impact has that had on our workforce? Well, again, it's unassuming. Right, you know, you you look at a ship dropping, uh, dropping off some product or goods, or uh, and and it's hard for the average American to turn around and say, "This is um, we are protecting us." You know, it's not like when you have a battleship in a port. It's not when you have a helicopter hovering over you. Mm -hmm. It's pretty unassuming. So, what basically, what basically the average American thinks is that they they listen to all the hype about raising costs on product. Uh, they, they listen to uh, uh, complaints of feather bedding. You know, big business has a big voice in bringing down the cost. Their interest is to bring down the cost, but you know, the average American just wants to be safe. Now, the functions of the Merchant Marine and Fisheries Committee have been divided up among other committees, and I was yeah. just curious if you thought that, it, as important as it is, should the Merchant Marine and Fisheries Committee be reconstituted? Well, you know, if you really want to fix a problem, if you, you know, whenever you want to address a problem, you have to be able to go head on. And by eliminating that committee, what they did is they broke it down into subcommittees. You know, subcommittee priorities are not always the committee's priorities. And uh, if we had, if we had a committee dedicated to, to cabotage and, and shipping in this country, uh, we would be creating a whole lot more jobs. Now, I understand some Jones Act ships are in danger at Philadelphia ship, Shipyard, uh, now in danger of not getting built. What kind of effect does that have on the, on the metal trades area? Well, very interesting part about the, Phil the Philadelphia Shipyard. You know, it got closed down in the Brack Commission back in the 80s. The yard was abandoned. So uh, the politicians had a vision to bring shipping back. And it became the first yard to build tankers in this country for 25 or 30 years. Steady flow over 14 years of ships coming in, but the market is so fragile that they lost one order of four ships and there was nothing else in the pipeline. So do you have any allies on your side to fight to save the shipyard? Oh yeah, yeah. You know, we have political delegations in three states, actually four states, that are very interested in keeping the yard open. Uh, we're working, working very closely with the Navy. You see, what we're trying to do is transition the yard, not only to do Jones Act work, mm -hmm. but why not do naval work? You know, the president is committed to a 355 ship Navy. These skills are very important, and they are transitional. So, why not, in the downtime or all the time, do government work? But in the meantime, we can still do, uh, you know, Jones Act work there. Given the national security implications of this, though, have you had a chance to talk to anybody in the, in the administration about it? We have, we, we, we've spoken to people in the administration, and you'd be surprised at some of the people in there and their level of interest in the Jones Act, because they do get national security. This administration, you know, has, does prioritize and really is committed to national security. But the, what I'm finding very interesting is how the Senate delegations and the House delegations, they're getting it too, because, you know, at the end of the day, national security is in everybody's uh, best interest, but also good, good jobs, right? Good paying jobs, you know, jobs that pay with benefits, okay? And at the end of the day, when you kill two birds with one stone, right? When you can go out and make a living and raise your family, and at the same time, enhance America's national security, that's a winning recipe any way you go.
Yeah, and there's a tremendous need. Where do we get the people to build these ships? Well, and it's a problem, right? America and the American worker today, uh, you know, the workforce is subject to demographics, right? Our workforce is aging. Okay, the baby boomers are retiring very quickly. They're bringing their skills with them when they leave, and replacing them is hard. Uh, the millennials don't necessarily want to get into the trades anymore. I mean, they, they've been brainwashed, to be quite honest with you. You know, people told them that you didn't have to go to uh, trade school anymore. You know, everybody could become a banker, you know? But the truth of the matter is, is you know, when you have a problem out there, you don't yell to a banker for help, you know, you yell to a, a first responder or a construction worker or somebody like that. So we have to go out and basically appeal to the young person's mind, right? We gotta win their heart, we gotta win their mind. And it's not that hard when you can, and I'm a plumber by trade. And if you would have told me back when I was 17, 18 years old coming into the trade that my trade would be one of the best jobs America had to, to offer back in the 80s, I would have laughed at you, mm -hmm. okay? But here today, okay, we have plumbers, pipe fitters, electricians, we have boiler makers, uh, insulators, you name it, okay? Techs, machinists. We have this beautiful mosaic of a workforce that makes more money than lawyers and doctors and, mm -hmm. you know, and accountants. Mm -hmm. And that's the message we have to get out to rebuild that workforce. And train it too. I mean, I think the shipyard, um, one of the big facets of it is the apprenticeship training potential. For and it. nobody trains better right. than America's metal trade unions. Yep. Okay, you know, we're partners, you know, we, we come out of the same fabric as the building trade unions. Uh, we have wonderful uh, training programs. We, we have the best training programs. As a matter of fact, if you were to take all the affiliated unions in, in the metal trades and you would take all their training programs, put them together, they would comprise the biggest school district in America. Mm. Okay, training hundreds of billions of dollars a year mm -hmm. devoted to training. And the difference is that the unions themselves through collective bargaining pay for the training. Okay, they're not looking for companies to do the training. They want to supply the workers. They want to supply the train workforce. And that's what makes our unions different than, you know, we're, we're out of the box. Mm -hmm. Interesting perspective uh, on the Jones Act from the metal trades people. Union, AFL-CIO, yeah. Jimmy Hart, President, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Dave. I appreciate you. Jones Act here, just the facts, another one in the can. Dave Gardy here for Maritime TV. Thanks for joining us from Washington, D.C.